It's been an interesting summer to say the least. I mean, multiple summer blockbusters have been flops, big movie bombs in the box office. You have the actor and writer strike that's going on right now that could potentially delay a bunch of movies and TV series that people are highly anticipating for. And there just seems to be this shift from actually going to the movie theater to going to streaming after the magic and wonder of movies is kind of going away for the comfortability of watching movies and TV shows on streaming. But there was one weekend that pretty much was a silver lining for not only Hollywood, for the audience, but just for everyone in general. And that was Barbenheimer. Barbenheimer, which was pretty much the weekend that was dubbed uh, for both the releases of Barbie and Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. This is uh, a whole weekend that shattered the box office, broke records, and really provided a lot of enjoyment for people, for both critics and audiences alike. And in today's episode of the Midnight Drop, we're just pretty much going to be doing some cool reviews of both Barbie and Oppenheimer and just how I felt about the films and just just going back to this overall weekend and just talking about just how I felt in general. Barbenheimer weekend was just a great weekend in general. I mean, like it's been a long time since I've gone to the theater multiple times in one weekend just to watch two really good films like going into this i was highly anticipating oppenheimer i had knew that oppenheimer was going to be a banger from the start it was going to be christopher nolan's next film i'm a big christopher nolan fan not as big as others to where they'll defend them no matter what i still think tenet and some of his other films were flawed but for Oppenheimer, I was really excited because I was really interested in the history of Oppenheimer, of the nuclear bomb, and I felt like Christopher Nolan taking a hold of this type of project, it was going to be really interesting, and I wanted to see what he could do. And for Barbie, it was a film that I just laughed out loud as soon as it was announced. I kind of loathed at the fact that it was going to be one of those types of films where they take a popular IP and they make something very generic and manufactured. And... As the trailers kept coming out and we kind of get like some more news about the plot, it seemed really interesting because it seemed like an adult version of Toy Story. So here we are with both of these films now out in theaters. They've made massive amounts of cash in the box office and the worldwide box office with Barbie now making around like 350 plus million dollars. And then with Oppenheimer making around 120 million plus uh, for its own respective box office. It, it seems to me like these movies are going to do a really good job and making profit but just has done a really good job and just entertained a lot of people and I think one of the first movies we'll talk about is Barbie because this is a movie where I felt like I had a little bit more time to think about and my thoughts are kind of straightforward and I'm not going to go into this super big tangent in like all these different points so with Barbie I will say this this film uh, was very interesting. It was definitely that adult version of Toy Story, and it was a film to where I, I felt as if that it provided a whole lot more than I expected. Like, I came into this film uh, thinking that it was going to be a movie where you have this whole you know toy brought to life type of story you're going to have this kind of like predictable type of plot revolving around human characters and that it was going to be some hilarity here and there there were going to be some jokes that get to you some jokes that make you cringe uh there really wasn't going to be the greatest dialogue all the time and there was going to be one character that steals the show and i felt like it was just going to be that from point a to point b and that it was just going to be an okay film and it was probably going to be in that list of midness with all these other films like indiana jones and the flash but coming out of the film, it provided a lot of things that I wasn't really expecting to see. Uh, this is a film that's made by Greta Gerwig, who's done a small amount of films and where not that many people know him. But if you're in the cinephile realm or you just love movies, then you know that she's a great director and she's a cool writer. And for this movie, you can definitely tell that Greta Gerwig came in and wanted to provide her own vision for something that people didn't really expect. Uh, it's a feminist heavy film that really goes in and, and just talks about feminism and its whole I guess message and this leads me into saying that certain people are not going to like this film I mean if you're a uh, an ultra Christian an ultra conservative if you use the word woke five times in your day-to-day -day life even though you hate the word in its entirety if you're 
homophobic, if you're transphobic, if you're any of the phobics or isms, then you may not like what this movie is going to talk about. But if you're somebody like me or if you're a woman or anybody, then you will really like what this movie has. You will respect it for its ambition and its vision. And this movie really had all of that. The story of Barbie is pretty much you have both the real world and the Barbie world that's separated. And the Barbie world is pretty much a world full of these Barbies and Kins that kind of just go by what their whole character bios of their toy versions go for themselves to where Margot Robbie plays the stereotypical Barbie. And the stereotypical Barbie finally figures out that she's having thoughts of death and having thoughts of all these different things that's not really part of her I guess you could say original programming and she ends up uh, finding that uh, her previous handler they're like the handler of her toy version is kind of going through some shit so she decides to travel to the real world and figures out that the real world isn't as sunshine and lollipops like she thought it was and she tags along Ken with the ride uh, Ken finds out that men are actually in control in the real world and it goes into this whole spiral to where he ends up becoming the secret villain and I think for this plot like I said it's feminism heavy it has a big message in it but I will say that it's something that people don't expect, and this is where the ambition comes in. See, like for films like Barbie, you would feel like it's going to go that predictable manufactured route to where you just got to kind of get what you're going to get and that you're really going to have to focus on the goofiness and the hilarity. And while there is goofiness and hilarity with Barbie, there is also some really cool stuff with just how it does have like this message to say, yes, the message can beat you over the head with it. And sometimes it's not really subtle, but at other times they do a really good job in just portraying what Barbie's going through. Like the jokes you've been hearing about how Barbie Barbie's going through an existential crisis, how she's going through this whole identity image type of crisis. It's real. Like there are moments in the movie, which were my favorite scenes in the film, to where she just kind of just embraces the entire world where she just feels everything. She starts to cry for the first time. She feels emotion and she questions herself, her beauty, who she is, all of that. And I felt like when it really goes into those moments, I think those were like really standout moments for not only Margot Robbie, but for Greta Gerwig as a director. Uh, the movie wants to aim at this whole thing to where uh, Barbie is this person who kind of just fits like this narrow minded view of what a woman should be and just how a person should be. And when they step out into that world and kind of fear realize that like they don't have to be in that sort of direction. It goes into this whole thing of just this whole story, this whole theme of finding yourself and breaking barriers. And I thought that was really cool. Now, with the message about how it's like beating you over the head, it's the typical feminism stuff about like how women have it really hard than their male counterparts. And while I do agree with everything this movie had to say, and trust me, a lot of other people in the movie theater agreed with what the movie had to say. It did feel at times that like it just got to you and just beat your ha your head in to just say, like, listen, respect women Fuck the male patriarchy, all of that. It's funny for some parts and for other parts, you can say yes or what the one white woman behind me said, amen. <laughs> but at the same time, it's just like when you have those subtle moments like Barbie just kind of just embracing the world and learning about herself or at the very end, it's it's really cool. And you would think that the movie could do a better job in doing the rest of it in a subtle way. But alas, that's it. And I would feel like that's the only big problem that I have with the film. Besides that, uh, the story is still funny. Characters are still funny. The acting is hilarious. I felt like Margot Robbie was perfect for the role of Barbie. And by the way, it's kind of funny that Amy Schumer was also in the running to be Barbie. And I felt like if she was Barbie, that would have made the movie entirely worse. And I just wanted to put that out there because that's just so weird. Amy Schumer being Barbie, stereotypical Barbie. Like, I don't feel like that would really match Amy Schumer. And I feel like this movie would get a whole lot more Amy Amy Schumer was in it. I'm just saying. But besides that, like Margot Robbie was great. Uh, Ryan Gosling as Ken was someone who stole the show. He plays pretty much the, the stereotypical Ken who's always playing second fiddle to Barbie. And when he realizes that the real world uh, is ruled by men, or at least men have more influence than the Kins do in Barbie land, it becomes a thing to where it warps his mind, it distorts him, and it goes into that whole messaging of the film to where uh, men can fuck things up sometimes, and things are not very equal all the time with men and with women. 
And I still felt like with Ken, even though he was being an asshole and a dumbass most of the time in the film, he was hilarious. He was fun. And you actually felt really bad for him because at the end, it's like, yeah, Ken is just trying to get the attention with Barbie. And he just kind of wants to be with her. He just wants to feel seen. And it really goes into this big part of the film to where, yeah, like Barbie land, it's ruled by the Barbies, it's ruled by women. And that, yeah, when Ken does his thing with, you know, making it kingdom or whatever stupid name it is it, it gets to a point to where like yeah like kingdom sucks but at the same time don't you feel like it's good to kind of have like both ken and barbies feel seen and just equal and and that's something that where i did like what the movie did and ken you know ryan gosling being as ken he, he did a great job in it man um besides that you have this huge cast of semi lu of Issa ray of all these different people of all these different genders and sexual identities it's dope i mean like you have a trans barbie who's in the forefront of the film she was funny uh you have michael sarah who plays alan who uh, i want to say he's like a gay kin i don't know but he's honestly a cool character and i actually really liked and he made me laugh uh, there are just so many people in this film to where I had this worry that the film was going to try to have them have them shown as like glorified cameos. And there's one character who is and he's played by John Cena. He plays like the Ken Mermaid or whatever. But I still felt like everyone had a role to play and they were funny. And it does get away from this whole problem that I see a lot in films that have like this big cast is that you give them a little bit of screen time and you don't see them anymore and it's just like wait I want to see more of them and throughout this film you see sprinkles of like your favorite actors and actresses portraying these characters and you really like them and it's like yes this is perfect keep them on the sidelines but at the same time don't just put them there forever to where we can't see them anymore like we want to see them throughout the entirety of the film I will say the technical part of this film is amazing. I felt like in terms of set design, in terms of costume, in terms of everything of making Barbie land pop, this was one of the highlights of the film. And I felt like, uh, and I'll say this, this part of the film should be nominated for multiple awards. I mean, the fact that they used a combination of CGI and practical effects to where it didn't feel like it was more CGI, but more practical effects in its sense, it just felt really cool. And it actually kind of matched in with the lore of Barbie, how like how do you, they had all these different like Barbie play sets and costumes to where it felt like it was marketing for the Barbie toy line but didn't really glorify it or take over the entirety of the film. It really made it just felt like it was just fun little nod to just Barbie and the entire history of it all. And I felt like like when it comes down to the individual costumes and the history worlds behind it, I felt like it was really cool and it was really fun. And it did feel like you were immersed in this Barbie playhouse. And I feel like that's just one of the big points of this film that I just love in general. Um, if there's anything else to say about Barbie is that there is this point at the very end of the film to where it feels like it's going to go in this cringy, predictable route. And it kind of does. But then it goes into this moment where it kind of makes you feel a little emotional, where you kind of tear up a bit because it's just super wholesome and the message is there. And yes, the message beats you in the face with it, but you just sit there and you're just like, wow, this is this is really nice. This is heartwarming this is something that i didn't expect to see in a family friend like barbie film that i didn't expect to see in a family friendly barbie movie like this man like it's it's really cool and i think for the most part like the way it just ends with like this one joke it made me laugh my ass off and i felt like it was a perfect way of ending a film that did a really good job in making you laugh but also brought in something that had the director's vision in and I think if there's anything to kind of end or just to conclude with this part of the review is that Barbie is a film that I think it's not perfect. I don't think it's the best movie of the year, but I do feel like after much consideration, after much thought, it is one of my favorite movies of the year. It's something to where it was memorable. I don't really forget about it. There were wonderful characters of that really made me laugh and really had fun with there were parts of the story to where yeah it's not perfect but at the same time it really did get to me and i think overall like uh barbie really exceeded ex my ex 
really exceeded my expectations. And uh, I really have to give this movie more like a B plus. It's a fun film. It's a good film. And it really shows that Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach uh, did a good job in like implementing their vision and putting some ambition into this film that easily could have been something uh, as mid as like Indiana Jones or The Flash. Now with this next film, Oppenheimer, I will have to say in comparison to Barbie, not saying that Barbie is bad. I still think it's good. I just gave it a B plus. Oppenheimer is one of the best films of the year. I, I have to say after much thought, I think this film to me might be in the same contention as Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse to where it is one of the best movies I've seen this year. And it's going to be really hard towards the end of the year to look back at both of these films and say, okay, which one is better or just like, what do I pit over? one another like do i put spider-man across the spider-verse over oppenheimer or oppenheimer over spider-man like what is it and like i'm going to see this film multiple times like i've already planned to go see this with friends family just by myself and i'll say this like oppenheimer is one of those films to where i didn't think i would see myself seeing it multiple times because it's a three-hour film and it's not really like an explosion heavy film it's really just more on the conversation on the baiting part of oppenheimer's life and the manhattan project but like to me and i may be like an outlier and everybody else who saw this film but to me it's like those three hours of the film was well worth it and i could stay there for hours learning more and more and more uh, and if not hours, maybe for like 30 more minutes, because there were some other stuff I wanted to know or see from different people. So for anyone who's been living under a rock and just doesn't know what Oppenheimer is all about, Oppenheimer is the biopic of Robert J. Oppenheimer, who pretty much was the person who led the Project Manhattan, who led the Manhattan Project, who created the atomic bomb and is considered to be the father of the nuclear bomb, which pretty much led to all of this nuclear crap that we're always scared about nowadays with Russia, with America, with North Korea and just anybody else with a nuclear bomb. And the story really goes in into like this three hour epic of just talking about his own life, talking about the Manhattan Project, talk about how he created the atomic bomb and the fallout and the political drama that preceded it. And, you know, again, going into this, I was hyped. It, you know, I had like these expectations for this movie. It clearly met them. And. I just feel like everything about this movie had just some to say and just some really good things about it. Now, with Christopher Nolan films, like my favorite is The Dark Knight. Hands down, that's one of my favorite Christopher Nolan films, one of my favorite Batman and superhero films, and just one of my favorite films in general. And ever since then, I just felt like he has good movies, but there are just some points where I felt like it's either with the story, it's either with the sound mixing, it's either with the editing, that I just feel like Christopher Nolan could have been better on. In this one... I feel like it's one of his best films and it's one of those films to where you can clearly tell he put a lot of work into it. He was in his bag and that while he may not have been trying to chase for an Oscar, uh, he might have gotten it from this movie. Uh, I'm not saying this movie is definitely going to get an Oscar. Like there's still so many other films that are trying to get an Oscar that's going to be in the running for it. But this one here uh, is definitely a nominee for some people. And for me, it kind of starts off with the acting. Again, this movie is all about dialogue, debates, conversations, and I feel like when you have a cast like this, everyone from Killian Murphy, from Matt Damon, from Robert Downey Jr., to Emily Blunt, Rami Malek, to all these different people, they do a really good job in delivering you masterful dialogue. And when you have great writing combined with great acting, you get something like Oppenheimer. With Killian Murphy, Killian Murphy, uh, to me, was outstanding. I think he can get a nomination for Best Actor, and I can see why Christopher Nolan wanted to pick him as Robert J. Oppenheimer. It's like you're following this character of Oppenheimer from his young years at university, traveling the world, trying to learn more about, I guess, like theoretical physics or just trying to know more about just science in general to all the way to like him just being just old, just getting awards and medals from the president from trying to go into this, this whole courtroom drama that he's in. And I felt like with Killian Murphy, it's like, I don't know, like his, his face his, his mannerisms, everything just kind of fits Oppenheimer and just when you're trying to travel through younger years to older years. It's like with Oppenheimer when he first starting out, he's just like this young 
bright, energetic scientist who wants to learn everything theoretical wise. He grows around the country trying to learn as much as he can uh, while being this person that feels like he doesn't really belong in the community that he's learning in. And then he goes back to the States. He's working. He's trying to teach people just kind of the stuff that he learned. He's trying to bring in this new wave of like science or like just theoretical physics and, and just try to be to somebody that can really like change his country for the better because he loves his country. But at the same time, he still feels as if that they're lagging behind, not only in the science world, but in the political world. And there's even a point to where like you get to understand Oppenheimer's political views to where he's kind of like a communist or at the time communist when it's like the whole McCarthyism era. And then really in general, he's just like kind of like a liberal or a Democrat in today's standards. And there's even a point to where like those political views really travel all the way to like in his older ages and his older years even gets to a point to where in his romantic life like communism does play a big part with his relationships like there's a character in Florence Pugh who plays like this young woman that Oppenheimer is smitten to and there's a point where like the movie does stop and like kind of just shows him you know giving Florence Pugh the bomb like not the nuclear bomb like another bomb and it, it pretty much gets a point where like yeah, like Oppenheimer was a was kind of a simp uh, in his younger years. He was kind of a hoe, if we can just all be honest about that. But that's besides the point. Like Oppenheimer in that first hour of the film is pretty much just him living his young life and kind of being a little naive, but all for the love of the things that he cares about. Science, his country, and women. <laughs> but like later on in the film, like, this is when you really see Oppenheimer, who's portrayed by Killian Murphy at his best to where he's he's learning to create this nuclear bomb. He's, you know, overseeing and managing the Manhattan Project. He's creating these relationships with all these different scientists. He's becoming more involved in the political and military realm. And in, in like the third act of the film, just really seeing him, you know, reflect at all the decisions he's made and seeing him have this development to where he regrets decisions. He's proud of decisions. And really, he's looking at more things in this dark, complex type of view that kind of shatters him. Um, and I felt like with Killian Murphy, he does a great job in just getting all that together and just visualizing just what Oppenheimer thinks. And there's just several scenes to where you see that from him. And you're just kind of like, whoa, holy crap. This is just this is something to where you relate to this person that you can see the terror in his eyes. Like, I, I don't want to be weird with this, but like it's like the way his face is shaped, the way his bone structure is. It kind of feels like in some scenes, like they made him seem like he was the Grim Reaper. He's like this Grim Reaper who is just seeing all of this destruction and chaos that he causes and that he is just straight up regretting his decisions, like a, a decision that he was doing for the love of his country that has now backfired and has shown just what one man can give the world that can destroy its own self. And I felt like that's something that they really talked about in the film. And I felt like that was something that Killian Murphy did a great job in just portraying Oppenheimer for. Uh, besides Killian Murphy, like I said, you have people like Matt, da Matt Damon and... Uh, Robert Downey Jr., who are just fucking great. And besides Killian Murphy, you have other actors in Matt Damon and Robert Downey Jr. who are just great on their roles. And I bring up those two because those are the two actors that I've been hearing for the most part are in contention for best supporting actor if Oppenheimer gets any sort of recognition from the Oscars. And I felt like out of these two, in my humble opinion, Robert Downey Jr. deserves Best Supporting Actor over Matt Damon. Not to say Matt Damon was bad or just okay. He was also wonderful. But I feel like with Robert Downey Jr., especially with just how this movie takes his character of Strauss, the head of the AEC commission, he is somebody to where he really showcases his talent and reminds people of the general populace who have only seen Iron Man or maybe seen Tropic Thunder that, hey, I'm a good ass fucking actor. I can really put my foot into my roles. OK, do you know? Do you notice me? Do you notice me now? And like me just being a big Robert Downey Jr. fan, I'm just seeing his performance. And that's what made me get through the last hour of this film.
And then it's just like, wow, it's just his acting, his performance really gave it to me. Besides him, you have Emily Blunt, who does a really good fucking job in here. I mean, like, for the first two hours of the film, I was like, cool, it's Emily Blunt. She's his character who's the wife of Oppenheimer. She has her own thing. She has her own story. To be honest, I don't even know if I like her like that. And then the last hour of the film, she does some shit in here to where... Wow, she is the best wife you could ask for because she's the only one with some fucking common sense in here and with some perspective and some critical thinking skills. Like she actually gets shit done and she tells you like it is and you love it. I mean, the whole scene with her and Benny Safdie's character, the the whole scientist who wants to get the hydrogen bomb together. That was a badass scene. And with Benny Safdie, he does play that scientist who, who has the, like this hydrogen bomb created and wants to do as much as he can to get his own inventions out there. He kind of feels like he's a, a, a genius above geniuses in most of the film. And I, I liked his performance, even though his character pissed me the fuck off towards the third act. I mean, you have this whole range of, of characters, of actors and actresses who do their parts well, who do a great job. There's even points where like certain people come up that you didn't even know was coming in and you're just like, oh shit, I forgot you were announced to be in this film or I didn't even know you were going to be here. Like Rami Malek, he comes in here like a surprise and you're like, oh shit, I forgot you were in here, fam. And he doesn't even have a big role until towards the third act to where he gets some dialogue and it's just like, okay, you were one of my best surprises of this film. I forgot that you're Mr. Robot. You're you're a badass. You came in to save the day. But, I mean, besides that, I think the way that the story is done, if I can, like, describe it in any simple way possible, I'll say it like this. There's three hours to this film. The first hour, or the first act of this film, the, the beginning, is pretty much the young life of Oppenheimer. The young life of Oppenheimer with just sex, science, and in, in politics, whatever, I guess you can say like that. Uh, communism, hoes, and science. That's pretty much young Oppenheimer. And then the second part of this movie is the Manhattan Project and the nuclear bomb situation, just how that goes in. And then the third act is the political drama that's been building up since the beginning of the first hour and it's been constantly and consistently and steadily building up over time to where you get something that's super satisfying in this three-hour epic of Oppenheimer. And I will say this, and I will say it now. Yes, this movie's long, but if you can just go through everything and just kind of analyze all these different conversations and these characters and realize what's going on in the background and how you can kind of like put two and two together, I promise you the story will be super satisfying. I mean, pretty much what this movie is, is a, a movie that creates conversations of you know, was America right and wrong in what they did with the Manhattan Project with the nuclear bomb? Was Oppenheimer kind of naive and was he more politically driven than science driven and morale driven than he was when doing the Manhattan Project and his whole goal of creating the nuclear bomb? What is the whole concept of power and like is it really worth it at the end and like why are some people jealous and overzealous when it comes to the concept of power? I mean, when it comes down to science and morality how do we put two and two together and how can we use that to drive force as the driving force to creating a better society? You know, there's so many conversations that comes from this film that I just felt like for me as someone who likes films like these when they're done right. It was a treat to behold. And when you combine that with an amazing soundtrack that isn't Hans Zimmer, but more of like Ludwig Grossen, I don't know if I can pronounce that name right. When you combine that dialogue and that story with an amazing soundtrack to where that soundtrack does a great job in kind of rounding out the theme, the tone of these scenes, especially when it comes to like black and white scenes and when the tension is building up, it feels amazing. It feels great. It feels like you're really just immersed in this entire world of this movie in Oppenheimer. And I felt like that's what really took this movie away from me, man. Um, besides that, you have like these cool ass twists in these moments with certain characters. And I feel like I want to make another video just talking about the twist and the spoilers with this film, man, because there's so much that I love about them. Um, but there's also little things in here that makes you really think that are kind of more open ended, especially when it comes down to certain depths of characters, when it comes down to certain things that people ask and question, when it comes down to motives. I mean, there's so many things to talk about in this film. 
that I really need to do a deep dive and, and really just go in and just talk about everything about Oppenheimer because there's not enough time in the world to give you everything that I took away from this film without multiple rewatches and just some heavy ass research. But going into this, um, I, I felt like out of those three parts, all those three hours in the film, my favorite was that second part. And I think my second favorite was the third part, the political drama. And I feel like that's when a lot of people were saying that the film really drags. And I think for me, again, that's a great part in the film because that's where a lot of your great acting moments and your twist come in. And it's where Christopher Nolan had a vision and wanted to put it out there. He had so many things that he just wanted to pack it all in, but he does a good job with pacing and does a good job with setting the tone and stuff. And does a great job in getting things together to where it doesn't feel like a big plot hole or anything that it feels really good. It feels satisfying. Now I will say the time of this film may have been crunched down to maybe like two hours and 15 minutes. And this could have been a perfect movie. Cause I do feel like sometimes, sometimes you could take a scene or two here or there out. But I felt like overall, again, with the story, with the soundtrack, with the acting, it was perfect. It was something that I love the most. And it, when it comes down to those bomb scenes as well, those bomb scenes are done very well. I felt like overall, like for a film that was really heavily using practical effects, man, they did a great job in here with that editing, man. Like they did a great job in terms of just visualizing that explosion, making you feel that shit, especially if you're watching it in Dolby Cinema or in like 70 millimeter IMAX. Like they do a great job in here and just showcasing like science. Like when they're talking about a lot of things science wise, it's like, they help you visualize what they're talking about by showing you a cool visualization of like maybe a collapsing star or like atoms coming together or like a neutron splitting apart or how a bomb goes off or how a nuclear bomb is created or stuff like that. Like the process of everything. And if you're a STEM major or someone who majored in STEM, whether you're a biologist, a chemistry major, a physics major, or anything, you will love what they got here. Like I will make a petition. Like, I will make a claim and say that maybe when it comes down to high schools and colleges, why don't you just show them a movie in Oppenheimer? Just go ahead and show a movie Oppenheimer. Uh, make people write a, a, a two-page report or a one-page report of how they felt about the film and showcase why this film is important for scientists and just showcase why it, it's just a great movie in terms of how it visualizes everything that makes scientists or biologists or anybody in the STEM field just go giddy. And and just how like why all of this is just super important. Like, again, this biopic does a great job that uh, other biopics should really follow for, man. It doesn't really follow a certain formula. It does some here that kind of breaks the mold. And I felt like for how this movie is compared to other biopics, I felt like it's comparable to some like Elvis of last year to where it does a lot of good things in visualizing the tone of the film. But the difference between this and, Op and Elvis is that. Elvis was just super fucking bombastic, and I did feel like at some points it was horrible. But in here, in Oppenheimer, like this one, through in and throughout, the movie's consistent. It's great. It doesn't do too much. It wants to tell you a great story and doesn't do any type of, you know, fantasization bullshit, but it just tells you a story, point A to point E, but I also give you something that's visually satisfying, and that's what I really liked, man. Um... I don't know if there's really any problems to have with this film. I think the only thing that I had a problem with was maybe Florence Pugh's character because, man, she was such a bitch. I mean, but that's it. Like, I felt, I still felt sad for her, but at the same time, I'm just like, damn, this guy is giving you flowers and, and really wants you, and you hate seeing flowers. And, like, you can tell she got some mental issues, and it's just like, you can be mad at her, but you're more mad at Oppenheimer because it's like you can clearly tell she's going through some shit. Why don't you give her her space, leave her alone and chill? But it's just like, no, no, you're just a simp. You're just a, a happy, science loving, quantum mechanics loving simp. That That's what you are at some points. But yeah, like, there's even one thing with Florence Pugh that makes you go like, wait, what happened there? But like, I don't like her character as much because I felt like there could have been more done with her, if you know what I mean. But overall, like. Man, like I said, Oppenheimer is up there with Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse as how good can this movie be, honestly? 
And I felt like for what it is, it's definitely going to be nominated for a lot of awards. They're definitely going to be seeing a lot of actors and actresses be over here in contention for nominations for the Oscars. And for me, as a as a you know, a grade, I give this movie an A plus. This is a, a great film that if I felt like they cut the time a little bit, this would have been one of the best movies of all time. But that's just me. I will say this just after reviewing both of these films is that Barbenheimer is straight up just a, a really cool treat to behold, man. I mean, like, it's been a really rough summer. It's been a really rough year for, like, Hollywood and films. Like, you have a lot of great films that are bombing. You have a lot of bad films that were supposed to be great that are bombing. You have a lot of things going at right now to where it just feels like uh, Hollywood's on a huge decline. And with, like, this actor and writer strike, like, who knows what's going to happen in the future, like you want these actors and writers to be paid. You want the CEOs to have some sort of accountability and you want things to just go back the way it is. But with Barbenheimer, it feels like you got that little slice of positivity. Like it doesn't matter about all the negativity that both movies make, you know, may, you know, get or whatever like that, especially Barbie. It doesn't matter about any other negative opinions or anything like that. The fact of the matter is that Barbenheimer got people together for a nice slice of of ambition, creativity, vision, and just positivity with movies in general. And I hope we get more weekends like this. I feel like the one weekend to where we're going to get something close to that, that isn't really like a double feature, but just a cool movie in general is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. But I feel like this movie, this whole weekend in general, which is fucking awesome. So again, thank you so much for just watching, listening to the Midnight Drop. Hope you guys stay tuned for more stuff and we'll catch you guys next time. Peace.